Hello everyone and welcome back to my campus office. I wanted to talk to you today because uh, first of all on the syllabus you might have noticed that I have two September 19th reading assignments for you. I don't know why that happened but the good news is that it's not excessively um, long and both readings are a well, relatively quick read I hope. So hopefully that's not too bad for you. So today we're going to talk about Christine de Passan and we're also going to talk about Peter Ramis. So let's start with Christine de Passan. She is a little less exciting than Peter Ramis in a lot of ways, but why did I have you read this? You'll notice that Christine addresses her work to, and I quote, the princesses. Who does she mean here? Well, she's talking about because her education was in under the purview of a king whom her father worked for she was able to get the kind of training that's needed to be a courtier, to be a princess, to eventually become a queen, a, a lady to a lord, for example. And one of the things she wanted all of us to understand was that it is possible for women to have an impact on their partners if they approach it the right way. Well, most people would say, well, you know, in the medieval times, women didn't have any rights. They couldn't speak in public. They couldn't do anything. Well, that's not exactly true. You see, Christine tries to tell people how women, how to become a part of the process. So we know that she was raised in uh, a castle. Um, we know that she was raised under the purview of a king, which meant that she got an education, unlike a lot of ladies at the time. A lot of women didn't get that education. They didn't have the opportunity. They were working on their little fiefdoms. They weren't doing anything other than generational work of tilling a field for a lord um, or a knight or whoever owned that land. She had this incredible opportunity because her father worked for the king. One of the things that she started to look at was how a woman could present herself in court. And her reason for this was multifold. But her main reason for writing these books, The City of Ladies and The Treasury of the City of Ladies, was to make money. And I say that because Christine was left with, I believe it was her mother-in-law and her children, and her husband died very, very young. So Christine was the only one who could actually take care of the family. So she would write poems and write favors and things like that. But these books that she published were her way of making money. This advice that she was able to give to princesses was her way of making money. She wants to look at how it is that we can take a first step towards credibility. Now at the time, women were not allowed to speak in public because it was considered uh, beneath women. It was considered a dirty job. Therefore, men should do it, not women. It also exposed you to the public eye and women should not be exposed to the public eye during the medieval period. So most of the time public speaking was for men, but Christine got away with writing. And she also got away with talking about persuasion in the court by talking about one very important key element. That is a person's virtue. And by a person here, I mean a woman's virtue. What does she mean by virtue? I mean, that's a interesting word, right? She almost literally means your virginity, your purity, because the one thing that helps you get to court to be able to share your ideas, to marry a prince, whatever your end goal is, is your reputation. So the key element for her is your reputation. Now, remember that credibility comes with both a need for your good character and goodwill towards your audience and also knowledge. She was speaking to princesses who would have that knowledge already and reminding them that the only way that they're gonna get anywhere 
is by having a reputation for being intelligent and for being pure. And I don't just mean virginity in sexual terms at all, although that was part of it. I mean in the sense that there was an innocence there and you were able to use that innocence to um, to make an argument. So the key from the Treasury of City of Ladies particularly is your reputation is more important than anything else. So you should maintain that in order to be able to work your way uh, through the court system. And again, I know she says princesses, but uh, I think your book has that edit in there that I should say um, that uh, translation, not edit, but it does have that translation in there. And she doesn't just mean women at the quali qualifying level of princess, but all the courtiers, all the people who might want to be princesses someday, and so on. So yes, you must learn, but she's speak speaking to people who already learned, and you must protect your reputation in order to go to court. Those things seem kind of obvious, but at the time, women were not given any guidance on how to speak at all, because they very rarely were allowed to be in a position of speaking aside from their personal conversations. It was a very dark time in the medieval period. Um, as we start to get towards the end of the medieval period, um, and we just came off of Augustine, we have Christine de Passant. When we get to the end of the, the Dark Ages, we pick up a couple of people who um, are important. And I know that I have you read Peter Ramus, and so that's the one that I'm gonna talk about today. And if I also have Margaret Fell on the schedule, then I'll be getting her a different day, I'm pretty sure. I just wanna double check your syllabi. I literally just looked at this like minutes ago. You would think I could remember, but my mind is a sieve some days. So on September 19th, yes, um, I actually don't have you reading Fell until the 26th. Okay, that works for me too. Um, these next uh, two people, well, Christine de Passant and Peter Ramus, coming towards the end more of the, um, the medieval period. Ramus was not super happy. Uh, he was a very angry man from what we can tell. He bathed like once a year. I don't know how that man was ever allowed anywhere near other people. He studied a lot because at this time, the educational system originally laid out by Cicero more than anybody else um, and Quintilian uh, was still, it was building and more people were getting the opportunity to become educated. And I don't think Ramus liked that very much, but one of the things he wanted to do was to be the chair of rhetoric, I believe, or the chair of law. No, I think he became the chair of law. Um, whatever it was he wanted to do, they weren't going to make him the, in charge of it. Um, philosophy was another one of his areas. And there were multiple reasons why they wouldn't let Ramus lead an academic uh, office, if you will, a whole department or a whole course of study. Let's talk about those reasons. If you read the work, and hopefully you did, it can be quite entertaining. Right, because I mean, just the title, um, Arguments in Rhetoric Against Quintilian, just that title alone, it's gonna be entertaining. How are you gonna fight with someone who's been dead as long as Quintilian's been dead? And what could you possibly have to say? Well, he doesn't only critique Quintilian. If you read the work, you know this. He starts off critiquing someone else very, very differently. So let's start at the beginning and go through his work and highlight the important parts. In the beginning, he starts talking about rhetoric, generally speaking, right? And he says, let's just start with the first mistake. The first mistake is that there are five canons that fall under the realm of rhetoric. He says that is not true. He said, God gave us two gifts. And by us, I mean humans. We were given two gifts when we came onto this earth. One is speech and the other is reason. 
And he said, those two things are not supposed to go together, work together. They're not a skill together. Instead, they should be separated. And so in the realm of speech, he put delivery and style. Okay, so he took those two canons and put them under speech. Under reasoning, which he then sort of terms the word rhetoric, he puts um, all the other three. He puts invention, he puts arrangement, and he puts memory in there. And he says that these two are completely separate things and they don't meet anywhere and it's ludicrous to have all five canons be rules for a practice such as rhetoric. So this is where we get the beginning of the idea that rhetoric, in this case, what he called speech, um, that rhetoric is nothing more than empty flowery language. That, that the idea that it means nothing or that it's lies or that it's uh, somehow artificial in nature and it doesn't mean anything. So that is sometimes how you hear the word rhetoric being used now. I, I'm used to it. it. It used to bother me a little bit, but um, nowadays I, I'm watching a TV show, I'm watching news, I'm watching coverage of some event, and they're like, well, and that's the rhetoric around this event. And I'm like, that's not quite what we mean, but okay. Or when they say things like, well, it's just rhetoric. So you know, just the rhetoric of the left, just the rhetoric of the right, just the rhetoric of the center, whatever. Um, and that indicates that it's not meaningful. And part of that comes from this division that Ramus makes between speech and reason. So that in distinction is very important. The idea that rhetoric is nothing more than style and delivery. Keep that in mind. It's nothing more than style and delivery. Now, that right off the bat is probably going to tick off some of the educators whose their education system was based off of the trivium and the quadrivium of the Roman um, era. Um, and so he already ticked off a good number of scholars. <laughs> so uh, that was easy. But he goes further. He says that Aristotle does not know how to reason. And he particularly picks on the syllogism. Now, his complaints about the syllogism are sort of weak, to be honest with you, but my favorite part is that he uses a syllogism himself to critique Aristotle's use of them. And it's just, it's just an invalid syllogism. Like, he doesn't even follow the format. So I'm not really sure why he wanted to do that or undercut the idea of reasoning coming from Aristotle, but he certainly did. But it's Quintilian that he has the biggest argument with. His beef is with this guy. He does not like him at all because Quintilian's definition of rhetoric was overbroad. What do I mean by that? Quintilian's definition included things that should not be included in rhetoric or oratory, okay? So how did Quintilian define rhetoric or oratory at this point? And he said, of course, that it was a good person speaking well. The fact that he said a good person right up front who's doing a practice of speaking well means that his definition is too big. It's overbroad, and because of that, we should disregard it. Taking into account ethics in speaking, according to Ramus, is a mistake. You wouldn't, I think some of the examples he uses is like, um, you know, for those who practice art, you wouldn't judge a poem the same way that you would judge a painting. It's not the same thing. So you wouldn't judge um, the ethics of a person and speech the same way. Now, personally, I think that Ramus misreads Aristotle and Quintilian, to be honest with you. I think he misreads them. A lot of people felt that he misread them. And that is why he wasn't really considered for chairs or leadership in the academy, because 
quite frankly, you want to take down some of the, you know, giants from which you came, uh, that gets people a little bit upset. They don't like it. They've been practicing a certain way. If we have these two gifts of speech and reason, he says those should be separated. And then I suppose we separate out ethos and ethics completely from those things. So all of these things have to be divorced from each other if we're going to evaluate them. This of course is in my opinion only, well no, I'm sure others agree with me, ridiculous. Of course you need to meet certain standards for these things and of course the, the standards can be put together and utilized for an art. The five canons of rhetoric are very different, right? I mean, we're talking about invention, it's separate from organizing or arrangement, which is separate from style, because there's three of those, three levels of those, um, which is different from memory or the rehearsing the tradition of giving a speech, and also, uh, finally, delivery. Those things are unique from each other. but. All five have to be present in order to practice rhetoric. You're taught this in Calm 115, although you may not remember. I know for some of you it was a long time ago, and you may have forgotten already. But you need all five of those things in order to be persuasive. I don't know if Ramus was just trying to not be persuasive, maybe, or if he was trying to say, persuasion is bad, or if he was trying to say that you can be either a learned person and a thinking person, or you can be a speaker, but you can't do both. I mean, I'm, I'm not really sure what his goal was, but the end goal was that he was run out of run out of the town on rails, basically, right? And um, he, it, I think he's the one that died in the St. Bartholomew massacre if I remember correctly and a lot of that had to do with him being such an outsider not academically speaking but he was an outsider in many ways he was also sort of a little bit of a, a of a revolutionary in in religious history as well so he um he took on the big guys and um he made this argument I mean I don't know if any of you have ever seen the princess bride but if you have, there's that scene where the man in black is talking to Vizzini and Vizzini says, have you ever heard of Aristotle, Plato, Socrates? And the man in black says, yes. And he said, morons. And I feel like Ramus is trying to do that exact thing with Aristotle and Quintilian. He's trying to say these people are stupid and don't know what they're talking about. So I'll leave you to read that because it actually is a little bit entertaining to read it, uh, it's it's now that you know what the plot is, which is there is no plot. He just wants to pick on Aristotle and Quintilian. Um, good times. Enjoy it. Why do we put it in here? Why do I have you read it? Well, first of all, I have you read it because critiquing Aristotle and Quintilian and whoever else is a good practice for learning about them still. Um, the second reason is it gives you a different perspective on Aristotle and Quintilian and just rhetoric generally speaking but third and probably most importantly it sets us up for an era known as the elocutionary period that's e-l-o-q-u you know what elocutionary I spelled that completely wrong it's e-l-o-c-u <laughs> t-i-o-n-a-r-y Elocution is the practice of the nonverbals and of paralanguage, right? Um, it is understanding specifically where, what your, your arms and legs and everything should be doing and the proper, proper facial expressions when you're speaking. And my grandmother, who, um, well, she's been gone for almost 20 years now and she was old when she died. So this would be a long time ago. She actually took elocutionary um, lessons when she was done with school. She was born in the 30s, I think. I might be wrong on that. No, she was born in the 20s, the early 20s, 1923. So she um, took elocutionary lessons. So this would have been probably in the 1930s to, you know, really 1930s. Um, 
that she would have taken elocutionary lessons. By the time I came around, we didn't do elocutionary lessons. We practiced forensics, right, or speech and debate, uh, where we learned all five canons, not just two. Um, and these elocutionary lessons, this movement away from equating rhetoric and reason and only equating rhetoric with good speaking skills, um, that movement split the way that we study rhetoric. There are sort of two timelines almost that you could follow. One where rhetoric is used just as a sort of pretty language uh, and good public speaking. And then there's another line where rhetoric is used in terms of its reasoning, which they confuse with science a lot because back then we didn't have all the instrumentation and everything that we have now for the practice of science. That is about to change in our history. So we are moving on next week to Bacon um, and some others, and they are going to help us understand the more uh, the, the reasoning side of rhetoric more. And so I'm going to take you on this little journey as we go. Some will be about elocution and some will be about rhetoric on the whole. Um, some will be about rhetoric as reason. And so we'll talk about all of those next week. In the meantime, what you need to know about Peter Ramos was that he divided the academic community and he split rhetoric right down the middle that he believed there were two gifts that we got when we were born. One is speech and one is reason, and they are separate things. And that rhetoric is merely delivery and style and nothing more. And that those other three live in the realm of reason and science and philosophy. That's mainly what you need to know. Okay. So I hope this helps you all. I hope you enjoy the, the, the reading. And I, and I say that not ironically. I, I really do enjoy reading, Ramus. So check it out. All right, everybody, I will see you next week. Have a great weekend.